scientist at IBM, and he's doing some really exciting work on neurosymbolic AI. Um, in short, what, what's the next chapter after deep learning? So most of us are still probably thinking, you know, how do I even jump the bandwagon and uh, join the deep learning stuff? But I think he's already ahead and is looking at more exciting part in the AI space. And he has a PhD in robotics from the yeah, from Japan, and he's previously worked for the CSIR. And Ibu, thank you for taking time off to come and share some of the work that you are doing with IBM. Um, I've had preview of some of the work that you have done there, and it's really exciting. And I'm I'm happy that you're coming to share with some of our participants here on Dama. The floor is to you. Welcome. All right, thank you for the invitation to share my work. Um, okay, I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, I, I hope everyone can see my screen. Yes, okay. we can. Okay, yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, so I am going to talk a little bit about some work that I've been doing at IBM Research um, here in Africa. Uh, based in Johannesburg, um, uh, but also collaborating with other uh, research lab at IBM uh, globally. Um, so, well, this is a, a technical talk uh, based on, you know, a, a new neural network framework that we call logical neural networks. Um, but I'll probably just give the overview of neurosymbolic AI uh, because I think it's a it's a new field that uh, many people may not be familiar with. Um, uh, I'll just start by an introduction to IBM research in general, uh, then dive uh, deeper into the topic of today. Um, so, you know, at IBM, we, we view the lab, uh, the world as our lab, and we try to come up with, uh, you know, uh, research, you know, that has some promising ideas and Try, try to disrupt technologies and try to transform industries and, and societies. Um, these are all the research labs uh, that we have globally, and these are just research labs and not you know, the commercial side of IBM, which is you know, distributed uh, across the, the globe. So we have uh, the research labs in different countries with their specialties. Uh, down here we have Africa, based in Kenya, and also uh, Johannesburg. Um, you know, at IBM, we actually pride ourselves as you know uh, a, a tech company that has that that's number one in patents in technology patents. You know, compared to our competitors, you know, this shows that we always strive to uh, to innovate and, and build new technologies. Um, you know, we, we, we hire scientists from different backgrounds, you know, up from the electrical engineering background, you know, we've got people in behavioral science, mathematics, computer science, and this really enables us to do, you know, interdisciplinary research that uh, attempts to solve some of the most challenging, uh, challenging uh, problems in the, in, in, the, in the world. Uh, we do research in different areas, um, we have reimagining computing, which includes quantum computing. Uh, we have we develop core AI algorithms, which is where I fall part of, I form part of, and we really try to apply these new technologies to transform industries. And this is our understanding of where AI is. You know, we've moved from what we call narrow AI, uh, which is basically a piece of code that can only solve a specific uh, problem. And once you try to deploy it elsewhere, it breaks down. We believe we are now at what we call broad AI. These are pieces of code that, you know, some components can be reused in different applications. And we are striving to move towards general AI, where you can have one single uh, software that actually understands the world the way humans see it, and possibly even uh, surpass, uh, you know, human uh, reasoning and, and, and learning. Um, 
you know, these are the different industrial revolutions. And IBM's perspective is that we are now in what we call the cognitive era, where we're actually argumenting human intelligence. Uh, you know, you hear people talk about human versus machine. At IBM, we take the view of human plus machine to take advantage of uh, our different capabilities. You know, more co concretely, uh, we have machines on the right side that are capable of doing large scale math uh, computations, uh, can do pattern recognition and statistical reasoning. On the left hand side, we have things that machines still struggle with, uh, but humans are very good at, such as common sense and, and value judgment. And we believe the combination of, you know, you know, the hybrid system of human and machine can lead to better decision making. Um, IBM throughout the time um, has used the idea of um, trying to solve challenging games using AI as a way to push research. And, and this is a trend that IBM started from you know, a long time ago in the 1950s where the first chess program was, de was developed and then also the first demonstration of machine learning. We also have a first demonstration of a neural network plus reinforcement learning, which is the predecessor to what we call deep reinforcement learning. We also have a first computer that built the world chess champion. And then also famously the first computer to, to, to beat uh, the best player in human jeopardy. Um, the latest work uh, in, in that regard to come from IBM is the project called Project Debater, which is basically an AI system that can debate with a, uh, with a human debater. Uh, there was actually a debate between the Project Debater with the best debater in the world in London in 2019. Um, although it lost, um, it actually um, showed that if you were to combine, uh, you know, a machine with, with, with a human, you'd actually get a better, a better performance. For example, the system was able to sift through millions and billions of documents to extract facts relevant to, uh, to a topic, uh, which is something a human is not able to do uh, very quickly. If you combine that with human reasoning and value judgment, um, you know, that, that, that becomes a very strong uh, combination compared to a machine alone and, and, and a human alone. Um, this has sparked other uh, interest from other tech companies to also use the idea of um, beating humans in, in, in games as a way to demonstrate the capabilities of AI and also push uh, research. And so this is latest work from um, Google DeepMind, uh, which was basically a neural network plus reinforcement learning that learned from self-play how to beat the, uh, the, the champion in, in, the, in a game of Go, which is a very complex uh, game to solve with a computer. So, Moving on to the topic of the day, um, I'll probably only give an overview of neurosymbolic AI. Um, I don't think I'll have enough time to delve deeper into um, our implementation or embodiment of neurosymbolic AI, which is logical neural networks. Uh, but if we get time, uh, we can uh, have some discussion on that. And also feel free to ask uh, questions as, as I go. So, most of most people are probably used to, you know, maybe the idea of deep learning, uh, and probably not a lot about symbolic logic, unless you did your studies in AI, you know, a, a long time ago. If you do AI right now, you're probably going to be introduced to machine learning and deep learning, and not necessarily symbolic logic. Um, so, if we look at the strengths of of deep learning, what, what really makes deep learning very successful is that it's able to, uh, to encode knowledge from unstructured data. Um, and also this, um, this, this allows um, engineers or scientists or practitioners to be able to extract features automatically from raw data. 
um, before deep learning, this actually required that you have some knowledge about um, the domain that you're working in, in order to manually build features that you then pass to, for example, a classifier, whether that's support vector machine um, or any other, what we'll now call classical uh, machine learning models. Um, so with the neural network, uh, it actually gives you the freedom to basically say, you know, I don't really understand a lot about this problem, but I have some data and I have some labels. I just want to fit this into a system that can automatically learn how to map from input to outputs or images to labels or classification, whether it's a cat or a dog, using the famous example uh, in, in machine learning. Um, but deep learning doesn't really solve everything, um, as uh, I'll discuss um, shortly. Before deep learning, and even before machine learning was popular, this is in the 1950s, 1960s, um, uh, like in the beginning of AI, uh, we had basically AI uh, was, was based on what we call symbolic logic. And the idea here was to handcraft system based on our, under, our understanding of how humans reason and, and handcraft that into a, a you know, representation that a computer can understand and process. And this was, this was basically, or the components of these were, you know, what we call a knowledge base, which is basically a collection of facts about some domain and some rules that humans will come up with that describe, um, uh, you know, the, the, that describe the dynamics of that domain. Given those rules, we can, we can handcraft logic programs that can answer queries, uh, can do reasoning and come up with, um, and do logical inference and come up with new facts. This basically attempted to model how humans think, um, you know, from how we understand from the outside. Whereas deep learning takes a biological approach and tries to open up the human brain and say, how does the human brain actually work? Of course, what we have today is basically a toy representation of how the, how the brain operates. We're still very far from actually understanding it. But what we have allows us to do some interesting things. Um, symbolic logic also has disadvantages, um, which is why, um, you know, we had, uh, I think, two AI winters before there was a resurgence in AI, uh, uh, primarily due to deep learning. So, Neurosymbolic AI tries to bridge the gap between these two systems so that you come up with a hybrid system that has the advantages of both systems and eliminates the disadvantages. Of course, neurosymbolic AI is not the only way of addressing some of the challenges in, in deep learning. There are so many other ways that do not try to bridge the gap between uh, deep learning and symbolic logic. So they basically believe symbolic logic, we shouldn't try to go back to something that didn't work. Whereas in a nutshell, what neurosymbolic AI is saying is, let's take what worked in, neuro, in, in symbolic AI, which is basically uh, the idea to do logical inference and, and reason and combine it with what's really good, what really works with, uh, with deep learning, which is learning from unstructured data and you know the gradient based back propagation that allows us to adjust weights according to what the the ground truth is uh, more concretely these are the, uh, the the pros and cons of you know neural networks and symbolic logic um, the good thing about neural networks is that they can tolerate noisy unprocessed data they require little expert knowledge um, so if I want to do image classification, I need images and, you know, their labels. Um, and I need some, I do need some background knowledge about how to actually uh, build a, a neural network architecture. Although these days there are so many open source um, uh, libraries that you, can, that you can use, such as Python, uh, PyTorch, that, that allow you to easily build a, a neural network or deep learning model. Um, very easily. 
uh, this can run efficiently in parallel, uh, which can take advantage of uh, cluster computing, so you can build models much faster by parallelizing them. Um, but they require large training, uh, large training data sets, which is why deep learning is more prolific in uh, image uh, computer vision, where you have lots of images, images and video available on the internet, and also in natural language processing, where you have lots of text, you know, Wikipedia and lots of documents that you can learn from. Um, they only good at the train task. Um, of course, they, there's work that tries to address some of these challenges. For example, um, pre-training a neural network. So you can pre-train a neural network given, um, say, in NLP using Wikipedia data and uh, transfer or fine tune that on your specific task. Um, neural network are largely uninterpretable black boxes. So it's very difficult to understand what, what a neural network has learned. Um, of course, there's a lot of work in interpretability and explainability that tries to either code open the box and try to understand what's inside or some post-processing um, work that tries to, uh, you know, based on um, uh, the outputs that a, a neural network gives you, you try to understand how it's doing the reasoning, but doesn't really tell you what's going on inside. On the right, we have symbolic logic, which is more interpretable um, because this is basically human knowledge encoded in some uh, representation that a computer can understand. Um, this can be verified um, very easily. So we can you really know when a system uh, gives you an output, you can, there are actually steps you can follow to understand why it gave you that output. Um, they are very generalizable to novel uses, but these are computationally intensive. They require extensive domain knowledge. So um, you actually need uh, someone that understands um, the domain. For example, if you, if you want um, to apply uh, this to uh, medical diagnosis, you do need doctors that actually explain to you how, for example, cancer behaves, so you can encode rules about how cancer behaves in, the, in, in this knowledge. Without that, the whole system breaks down. Actually, before machine learning, there was a field called knowledge engineering, uh, where basically people translate natural text, knowledge in natural text into um, you know, a knowledge graph or, or, or a logical representation that a computer can understand. Um, and also, most of this uh, symbolic system were based on logical representations that whenever you have an inconsistent fact or rule, the whole system breaks down. Um, in a nutshell, neurosymbolic AI tries to combine the benefits of, of you know, both sides such that we have an AI system that is trusted, extendable, uh, explainable as some form of causal reasoning and is and, and differentiable so that you can learn from data and also tries to blend perception with reasoning. I think someone unmuted. Maybe there's a question that want, someone wants to ask. Yeah, there's, there's two questions. Um, so the first one is, how does the new symbolic logic differ from what was in the expert system? Yeah, so this is basically expert systems. Uh, expert systems are built on uh, symbolic logic. And the next question is, how does the neurosymbolic AI relate to the Bayesian network that Paul has discussed? Uh, Bayesian networks if we just look at uh, probabilistic reasoning as, as a basis for, for that, um, it's more like an extension of logic uh, to deal with real valued, uh, with real values, because logic dealt with either zero or one, either something is true or false. And, um, you know, probability, uh, probabilistic reasoning basically extends that. Um, but there's also, fuzzy logic, um, which tries to, or which basically extends symbolic logic or classical logic to real values, which is basically the approach that we take. 
Um, but Bayesian networks are another way of, of, um, of addressing some of the challenges that um, symbolic logic faced. Although they are not very scalable, a lot of work recently has been working on trying to um, scale uh, uh, you know, Bayesian inference to, to, to large problems. Um, but neural networks are very, um, are very, are more efficient than that, which is why they're more popular. And by combining the benefits of neural networks and, and symbolic logic, we actually address the issue of um, uh, uh, classical logic, which is something that also Bayesian networks try to address, but we believe this is more, more efficient than just standard Bayesian networks. There's also some extension of, um, of classical logic, the idea of having facts and rules into a, a Bayesian interpretation called Markov logic network, uh, which is more of a, a I would say competitor to neurosymbolic AI. I think it does fall under the ban of neurosymbolic AI, although it's not neural networks and symbolic logic. It's more like probability and symbolic logic. Um, I hope that answers your question. To you, is, is that, are you comfortable with the answer? I'm not sure. Is it, yeah, he said it's, it's thanks. You did answer the question. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I don't know how many people in the audience are, are, are familiar with uh, symbolic AI. Um, I'll try to give a brief introduction, but I don't think I'll do it justice uh, in, in one or two slides. But I just wanted to give an idea of, you know, what it means to combine neural networks with symbolic AI. Um, so there are some components of, of, uh, of symbolic AI. One is the knowledge base, which is basically a, a set of statements or facts about a domain. Um, you can think of Wikipedia as a knowledge base, but in natural language text. There is actually a, 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 a version of Wikipedia called DBpedia, uh, which basically contains the same facts, but um, in a representation that can be processed by a computer. So uh, more specifically in, in first order logic. Um, this knowledge base has collects facts and also background knowledge or axioms or rules in some uh, logical representation. On the right, you can see a version or an example of a knowledge base where it has information about, you know, certain people, relations between them, such as these two people work together. Um, you know, this guy is a professor and teaches knowledge graphs, or knowledge graph, which is a course. And you basically have, um, you know, a collection of such facts and relations uh, in, in some form. And given that background knowledge, we can do inference, which basically uh, deduces new facts, uh, given facts that you have in the knowledge base and some rules of inference. Um, so that actually allows you um, not to store everything you know about the world, but enough facts and rules such that you can deduce new facts uh, as you're doing inference. Um, you can have domain-specific knowledge graphs, such as the one on top, or you can also have some general uh, knowledge graphs that basically describe, for example, this one tries to describe, uh, you know, social interaction between people. You know, you can have a person that plays a role of a child, can also play a role of a parent. Um, and given that, um, if, if you want uh, to answer some question, or you have a query that you want to answer, you can use such general knowledge basically in a way that humans um, uh, reason about, you know, human social interaction, but of course, um, in a way that a computer can, uh, can, can process. Um, 
more specifically, if we're using first order logical representation, which is widely used, um, you know, you have syntax and some semantics. The syntax contains objects, variables, and functions. So this basically takes uh, the view that the world can be viewed in terms of objects and properties of the objects and relations between them. And we can use some logical operators or connectives to um, come up with statements or sentences to describe the world. We also have quantifiers that allow us to make universal statements about the world or, or some specific constants about the world. For example, uh, in the bottom right here, we have a knowledge base, a very simple knowledge base in English that basically says, um, you have a fact that says Socrates is a man. So that's a fact. You also have a rule that says all men are mortal. Given this small knowledge base, I can actually do logical inference and say, therefore, Socrates must be mortal. This is a, an equivalent uh, knowledge base in first order logic, which basically contains a predicate, which is which describes a property of an object. The object is Socrates, which basically says Socrates is a man. And this is a rule that says for all X, if X is a man, then X is mortal. Then I can deduce that Socrates must be mortal. The whole of symbolic AI is trying to model human reasoning uh, in a way that computers can, you know, can, can understand and process. So this actually requires that we have a translation between natural language text to um, uh, first order logic in order to get computers to reason. Um, and in natural language processing, this is typically called semantic parsing, where given a, a natural language text, you want to identify objects. Uh, you also want to identify uh, properties and also relations so that we can build a knowledge graph out of that and then you can do reasoning. Is there a question? Yeah, and you know, it, this looks very much like the, the starting point of an ontology in terms of the constants and predicates and some level of connectiveness, but then you seem to be adding the inferences uh, and and logic deduction to establish new facts is that is that a correct assumption? Yes. Um, yeah, I think there is actually a project called I think it's called um, Psych, if I'm not mistaken, that tries to um, build an ontology of how the world works. Um, you know, so that you can actually use this in some of the uh, AI systems. Um, this this has been a way to, it, it, it is one approach to actually, I mean, if we look at, um, uh, if you look at a dictionary for humans, you know, it is some kind of a, of an ontology. It gives you a definition right. of, of different words. And that's, that's how, that's one way of um, how us humans learn. And this idea of building ontologies was a way to replicate that for computers so that they don't have to learn from scratch. Of course, the, the view of machine learning is, you know, every system has to learn from scratch, um, you know, from data. I just give it data and, and, and I learn from that. But here you basically saying we have some background knowledge that we understand about the world. We can encode it in an ontology or knowledge graph and we can give this to an AI system as some initial knowledge you can use uh, and you can do inference to deduce new things because a knowledge graph is never complete. So you have to do some logical reason to deduce new facts from facts that we know and rules that describe how the world behaves. Thank you. OK. Um, yeah, so basically, um, you know, the, the process of doing logical inference falls under, you know, an umbrella called theorem proving. Uh, you know, theorem proving basically, 
you know, says I, I have facts and rules. Uh, can I prove that something is true or not? Uh, but that is basically applying rules of inference to deduce whether something is true or not. Um, so this is a, a, a more intuitive example uh, of how you can apply. So this one is basically showing the, the, the hybrid system between symbolic uh, logic and, and, and neural networks. Um, if you're just looking at how you would do it with neural networks is uh, you, you basically feed a bunch of images into a neural network and give it labels, you know, such as this is a ground, that's a wheel, that's a wheel, that's a toy, that's a person, and hope that from, you know, uh, that large database, it can learn to label or caption a, a, an image. But that's pretty much what you would get out of it. Um, you can even maybe try to come up with such sentences, but you, you, you don't really have visibility into the rules that it has learned. In this paper, they try to show that if you try to combine this with symbolic AI, where you actually try to learn logical rules, you can actually extract uh, some rules that, um, well, that, that basically help you interpret what the, what, what the system is learning. Um, so these are basically rules that the system was able to learn here. So it's basically saying that if you have, uh, and, and so basically, okay, if we can read it from right to left, which basically says that if you have an object of some object and that object is a window, and you have another object of the same object and that object is a wheel, then that must be a car. Of course, this is not, not a perfect uh, description of what a car is, but this is what the system was able to learn um, from, from the images was presented with. And if for some reason it misspecifies or misclassifies uh, an image, you can actually go and inspect and see where or you know, what reasoning it performed. Um, you know, this is a second example that you know performs the same uh, the same kind of learning. Um, of course, to be able to learn such rules from objects, you need to be able to extract the objects themselves. Um, you can, of course, apply you know, your deep learning algorithms where you have labels, uh, and then you train it to you know to to label your image. Um, and, and you can give it a new image, you can try to label it. But you can also do it the way that uh, current machine learning practitioners, practitioners do it, which is basically crowdsource labeling of uh, you know, a bunch of images into objects and relations that are properties of those objects and relations between them. For example, here you're actually labeling that you have a man behind a girl and this is actually building an ontology um, from images that you can then feed into a, a, a neural symbolic system um, that can actually then learn rules uh, that, you, that, that are more understandable to, you, uh, to, to, to humans than the black, block, black box neural network counterparts. Um, I'll probably stop here uh, after, after this slide. So here, I'm just trying to recap what, what we've been talking about. We've been talking about symbolic versus neural. neural. But how do they actually, uh, how, how can you actually bridge them uh, to, to come up with a neural symbolic AI, uh, with, with a neural symbolic system? On the top left, you have a simple um, a, a, a logic program in propositional logic which of course basically requires that, you know, in this simple example, you're trying to predict whether something is a cat or a dog and whether if something is a cat or a dog is a pet, because it's a simple example, but you can see that you actually do need uh, domain knowledge about, uh, you know, pets, cats and dogs. This is a handcrafted rule that basically says, um, if you observe an object that has whiskers, and has a tail, 
And if given a laser pointer, it chases it, then it must be a cat. Then you also have another rule that says if something is, is a cat or a dog, then it's a pet. Um, of course, if you know nothing about cats and dogs, either you can build a system or you have to get someone that um, you know really understands the domain of cats and dogs. Um, and, and that's why expert systems um, go to a point where people got disinterested in them. Because every time you have to build a new system, you need to get an expert in that field so they can build uh, your rules. On the other hand, with neural networks, you just need a bunch of labeled data uh, and some knowledge about you know, building neural network, neural network architecture. But on the side of the domain knowledge about cats and dogs, you don't really need to know much. You just need to label your images. Then you can build a classifier. But if you look at um, early neural networks, before convolutional neural networks, it was all um, fully connected neural networks where you have the input layer, hidden layers, all the way to output layers. When you wanted to do image classification, because an image is basically a 2D structure, if you're looking at um, uh, grayscale images, so with just one channel, if you're looking at uh, RGB, you have three channels, red, green, and blue. So you have three of these 2D structures that you need to fit into a neural network. So one, uh, a pre-processing step back then was to basically flatten or unfold this image into a one-dimensional, uh, sorry, into a, a, a high-dimensional vector that you then feed into a neural network. And to actually learn a good model, this required a lot of data. But what people realize is that there's some information that we're not uh, using, that we humans understand, but we're not encoding into the neural network, which is basically that an image is a 2D structure and neighboring pixels share some information, which is where the idea of convolutional neural networks came, came apart. That was, that, that's an example of using um, uh, domain knowledge, in this case about image processing into neural net networks. When neural networks started, it was all about let's let's forget everything about, or let's forget everything we know about some domain and just get some data and labels and hopefully learn something useful. And then we start realizing, yeah, but the training times is, you know, uh, is, is very large. It's, you know, this is learning very slowly. We need a lot more data. Um, so then you start encoding some knowledge you understand you know, about the problem. In this case, image, uh, image processing, which is okay. Images are basically 2D structures. So if we come up with some operations that we don't necessarily learn, we handcraft, we can significantly uh, increase the computations, which is what CNNs do. Um, with neurosymbolic AI, we're going a step further and saying, uh, but we also understand some rules about uh, how our domain behaves. Can we actually also encode those rules into a neural network architecture and learn those things that we are not sure about? And in the bottom left here is uh, our logical neural network uh, that we're developing at IBM, um, which basically translate a logical program into a neural network graph where you have inputs, uh, which are um, in this case propositions, uh, which can basically be binary vectors. And the neurons actually correspond to the logical operator. So you have a conjunct conjunctive neuron, which is basically the AND operator. You have an implication neuron. Uh, you have a disjunction or an OR gate uh, neuron. And the idea here is that um, you, so from the neural network side, what you, what we actually inherit is the weights on the edges and then also back propagation. So the idea of uh, making predictions, comparing to ground truth and back propagating gradients uh, on the, uh, you know, the relationship between the errors and the, um, the, the, the weights. 
uh, by propagating the gradients and updating the weights. And what this actually allows us to do is you can start with a rough idea or an inaccurate rule. Uh, that actually helps you make some good predictions, but not perfect. And you can have some label data that you can actually use to correct those, those rules. So use to correct um, the weights. And to make this possible, there are actually five uh, uh, things that I actually have to do. In logical, the logical operators are actually not differentiable. But in neural networks, you, you require activation, activation functions that you can back propagate over. So this is basically replacing the logical uh, operators with their differentiable operators. For example, the conjunction, logical conjunction, can be approximated using a product of the of the inputs. So you can use a product of the inputs as an example uh, of, of, of an activation function or a neuron that you'd use there. You also want these activation functions to be in such a way that they preserve logical topologies. Uh, in simple terms, this basically means that your neural network, when you do inference on it, it will remain logical. So it will obey all rules of inference. Whereas you know, a standard neural network you know, doesn't really care about you know, the system being logical or not. Um, and this, you also want weighted propositions. So these are weights on the, on the edges. Um, something that neural networks doesn't, uh, don't do is the weight updates are not constrained. So the weights can be anything as long as they minimize uh, the error between the predictions and the ground truth. So in, the, in a neural symbolic system, you actually want to constrain your weight updates. And the reason for doing this is because you want your system to remain logical. So you want this conjunctive neuron to remain a conjunction. You want that to remain a, a, an implication. So uh, one of the weights is, uh, one, one of the uh, constraints is that your weights are between zero and one. Whereas in the neural network, they can be really be anything. So you want your weights to be to remain between zero and one. Um, you also want your activation such that the you have real valued input and output. Whereas in a in a in a symbolic logic system, you only have either zero or one. So here the output can be anything between zero and one, which has some interpretation as a probability. Um, there's some work that, that tries to show the connection between real valued logic and uh, uh, probability theory. I hope this gives a picture of uh, you know, the, the hybrid system between symbolic and neural, neural networks. Next, just some things that uh, we are submitting to conferences and, and journals coming out of our research lab, so you can have a look uh, for more details. Uh, for more details, I think I'll, I'll stop here for you know, for the discussion. Thanks, and there's there is one question. The question is uh, neurosymbolic found uh, intuitively appealing, but how do we explain that alpha zero without learning rules beats alpha go with rules? exceptional, but what is it due to the nature of the domain itself? Again. Um, so I couldn't hear that properly. I don't know if it's my network. I only heard how do you explain alpha zero, alpha go? Um, okay, so it's in the chat box. So if you look in the chat box, oh, okay. Um, Maybe I can read it out again. Um, how do we explain that alpha zero without loading rules beats alpha go with rules? Okay. It's right down at the bottom. There we go. How do we explain that alpha zero without loading rules beats alpha go with rules? Uh, um, I think. Let's see if I understand it um, correctly. Are, are you talking about 
rules that any kind of rules that we can load uh, into alpha zero or are you saying alpha zero actually has rules that it uses currently i think if if the if you can actually explain or clarify the question is that possible hey, um, yes uh, i'm trying to unmute myself um and i hope you can hear me yeah? yes okay great thanks no firstly i have to explain that i'm not technical at all i'm just kind of reading and observing the the space with interest and, and mm -hmm. some of my understanding could be really not right um, but okay. what I read about the whole Alpha story is that Alpha Zero, which basically didn't feed into any rules, beat Alpha Go, which had some rules feed into it. So my question is, I mean, the, the whole idea of the neural symbolic, I mean, it really sounds very appealing. I mean, there has been so many dis debate about, you know, the, the not explainable and all the, you know, Gary what's his name was really also talking about trying to move into more building into the logic but then how do we really explain if alpha zero doesn't have really i mean the rules it all learned by itself and alpha go actually people feed some rules into it i mean whatever rules i don't know but there were some rules so that example almost shows that actually without rules that the AI can just figure out and actually that's better. So I don't know how do we explain that? Is it because the domain is different or is it because it's just an exceptional example? I, I don't know. I'm just kind of curious mm. about what can be, you know, the reasons or the explanations rather. Yeah, so when, when you mentioned Gary, you're probably referring to Gary Marcus. Um, yes. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, he's, he's the He's an advocate for trying to incorporate symbolic reasoning to neural networks. Um, there are people that disagree with that. Uh, one example of such a person is Yeshua Benjo. So actually, there is a whole debate. Um, yes, I've read that with interest. Yeah, so um, at the moment, I mean, from the perspective of IBM, where we try to make, of course, theoretic, theoretical um, advances at the same time while building practical systems. Um, you know, what you're describing was demonstrated in a, uh, you know, a specific domain of playing games. Uh, you know, IBM, for example, is trying to build uh, question answering systems, you know, for chatbots and all that. Um, so for something practical, um, you want to incorporate as much domain knowledge as, as, as possible. But if we are talking about building general AI systems, um, I, I did attend, I think it was a conference at uh, International Conference of Learning Representations, where there was a keynote by um, a professor called, well, it's is known as the godfather of reinforcement learning. He wrote a book, Introduction to Reinforcement Learning. Um, he says something like, I think trying to, um, trying to incorporate human understanding of the world into AI system is probably not the right approach because who says we understand everything about how the world works? Um, so he's, he's of the view that we should try to build systems that can learn from scratch on their own. But of course, that's a theoretical uh, you know, discussion. I don't know how long it would take, even, even if we were able to build such a system, how long would it take to actually learn um, you know, what, what it needs to learn to perform well? Um, but also, Alpha Zero, I think well, what you're referring to was in comparison to Alpha Go, where Alpha Go actually they initialized the, the model through supervised learning, where you had uh, human versus human playing against each other, generating a data set, and also it playing with other humans, you know, generating a data set and learning from that. 
whereas Alpha Zero learned from scratch. Of course, Alpha Go learned much faster, whereas um, Alpha Zero will learn much more slowly because starting from, uh, from, from scratch. Um, this could define domains. Uh, in games, yes, you have a simulator that allows you to run uh, experiments in faster than real time. You can just leave it playing on its own um, online, you go to sleep or whatever. But if you want to build um, a practical system, you probably want to inject uh, some, some knowledge into it. Uh, and if, if you're listening closely to what I'm saying, I think I'm shying away from saying, yes, let's build systems from, let, let systems learn from scratch because this demonstrated that it's possible. Uh, and, and I'm leaning towards if you want a practical system, why not use knowledge that you have already? Maybe another thing is if you have a system that actually, yeah, uh, with a logical neural network, um, you can start with rules that you encode. Uh, and then the system can actually learn on its own on top of those rules. And if those rules start contradicting with what it's observing, can adjust its weights uh, so that it can adjust the, the, the rules to apply more uh, uh, to, to to apply more to what it's, what it's observing. I don't know if that uh, answers your question. Am I still online? Do you know, yes, you are. Yes, you are. I just, <laughs> I'm not sure what her response is. Yes, it's she says. It, it has answered the question. Um, yeah, I try my best. In my defense, it's an ongoing uh, debate. I don't have a, an answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shima, is there anything from your side? Is, are there any other questions from the, anybody else would like to understand more? If, if I may just ask um, a plain question, Dubois. Um, is this direction an indicative yeah. that the world is start to, starting to rethink um, AI? Or this is more a continued evolution of AI? Yeah, I think this is more a continued evolution. Um, what, I, what I've noticed um, over the years is that, I don't know if it's a human trend in general, um, we try something, if it doesn't work, we ditch it and come up with something else. Like we ditch it completely and come up with something else. Only when you realize that thing doesn't solve everything to be try to address its, its limitations. Uh, and I think this is what's happening here. We started with symbolic AI, it didn't work. Uh, we ditched it. Uh, actually, there are some people in the background that try to uh, to make it work while others look for something new, which in this case is machine learning and more recently deep learning. And only when we reach the limits do we say, or oh, is there something we can learn from what we ditched long time ago? And I think that's what Neurosymbolic AI is doing. But also there are some people that are continuing uh, uh, developing, uh, I would say, pure learning system. Uh, uh, rather than uh, creating hybrids with other um, representations of knowledge, they're basically saying, how can we improve the neural network's representation themselves? And um, convolutional neural networks is one way of, of doing that. Now you have uh, attention models that are the basis of what you would call transformer-based uh, uh, NLP systems, um, such as uh, BERT or GPT-3. You know, that is still building on, on, on uh, neural systems. So instead of saying, what are the ideas can we combine with neural networks, saying, how can we further improve neural networks? Of course, there's still limitations. You know, there, there's work showing that uh, uh, you know, these language models based on BERT and GPT, they don't really understand language. Of course, you feed, it, you feed them a lot of data and they can find some correlations in terms of, you know, what 
as how a sentence sentence is structured. But they 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 are known to to make some some stupid mistakes because there's really no no understanding. But yeah, it, it is a, co a continued effort to advancing AI. I wouldn't say it's really rethinking AI. Maybe it's rethinking deep learning or neural networks, but not AI. You know, as as a broad uh, discipline. So if I may ask the, the, another question, um, is it that an indication of lack of confidence on neural networks, or is it uh, an appreciation of that, you know, um, there are a lot of limitations surrounding data? Yeah, I think it's more appreciation, at least from academia, you know, which is where I'm from. Um, when you look at science, um if if your hypothesis if if you prove your hypothesis wrong you know you want to come up with a new hypothesis you don't um you know keep pushing the same idea that's not working so i think it's more appreciation of course there's hype uh and, and that hype also helps you know realize some of the limitations in, in whatever hypothesis that we have because now people take these systems and try to apply them practically and they realize, oh, it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that. Um, while that hype is playing out in the industry, scientists in academia, actually scientists in academia already know what the limitations are, but you know, there's media that's hyping everything. Uh, so, um, but scientists keep addressing issues in the background um so yeah it's it's more of a uh, appreciation of the of the limitations i don't know if someone's speaking on mute i think it was me i just wanted to ask if there any other questions any anybody else you know thank you so much for for your input i i really found it very helpful and understanding it's really nice to hear what you're doing and, and how far you're progressing. It's, it's lovely to see the extent as to which systems are developed. Now, even if we have to throw away and start again, I think it's important that we keep on moving forward and overcoming some of the limitations and the time that it's taken to learn. Thank you very much. Thanks for your contribution. And I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Anything from your side, Mashima? Uh, nothing from my side, but just to say thank you. And um, I hope, you know, the research that you guys are doing will help us so solve some of the complex problems that yeah. we are facing as a country. And But yeah, all the best and thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks for thank attending you. and see you right. next month.